have you been hearing in the uh, Fin Twitter macro space this idea of uh, populist agendas for the U.S. government, or not even just the U.S. government, but governments around the world, that the people being elected are populist in their policies? Nope. I don't have an opinion on this one. <laughs> right. Well, the, the short form of this is the um, – because I've been wondering, what am I going to do if the Democrats win or the Republicans win? Like, wh what kind of thing should I expect? Yeah. And even though their policies, in a sense, um, you know, leave military aside, the policies are essentially, uh, the fiscal policies are essentially going to be massive spending, no matter what. They have different things they want to massively spend on, but no side is talking about cutting, like net cutting of, uh, of uh, the, the deficit. And so... Uh, if there's going to be massive f fiscal spending, and if it's a populist agenda, that means a large swath of the the, the population is what's being catered to by the the policy. Um, they have to fund that through the bond market, and already we're at a massive um, uh, massive def deficit. Like usually, when a crisis happens, they need to, like we saw in COVID, pump a bunch of money in in order to uh, to get people out. But it usually comes on the heels of there being a period of not doing that right where the 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 deficit wasn't increasing dramatically or the spending wasn't increasing dramatically but we've had a dramatic increase in spending even within the last um the last couple of years mm -hmm. that when a crisis comes it's going to be exacerbated more than than we've ever seen and i'm like hmm i know i've been speaking very nonchalantly about like crises over the last um a uh, couple of episodes but um I'm wondering if this could be the one that then breaks the dollar, that then mm. breaks the markets, and that really makes it so that it all gets shattered. And then, obviously, my question after that is like, you know, what's the trade? <laughs> what's the trade when it all goes to um, all goes all goes belly up? I'm not entirely well, sure. Short the dollar, that that would be the first thing. But uh, I <laughs> and short the whole market. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think there are a couple obvious factors that come from the type of agendas that. Uh, that we're seeing show up. One of the agendas that I'm also concerned about is effectively around tariff uh, tariffs in the United States. And I think the the types of tariffs that that Trump wants to introduce would ultimately have an impact on inflation in a negative way. Mm -hmm. There's really not a lot that you can do to um, to to uh, to decrease the the price of goods if the cost of importing those goods has gone up because of tariffs. Like it's it it's illogical to me to try to raise those tariffs and expect that it's going to have a positive impact on pricing uh, here in America, given that we um, uh, we import a, a vast majority of our goods and you know we're a very service oriented uh, nation. So I think that that is going to have obvious implications on market volatility, that that will start to show up across the earnings reports of companies because even their cost of you know, sourcing materials is coming from imports and that's going to increase the cost of operations and CapEx that's going to you know reduce overall margins. So I think we're going to see those types of uh, uh, market shocks take place if Trump is to be elected. Uh, because I think people are already starting to establish a game plan for exactly how the market will be impacted if he is elected, right? Like if if you if you have a if then proposition in place uh, for the election already, that would be part of what you'd bake into your thesis is uh, tariff implications and obviously overall inflation implications that come from that. So so then I wonder if like so I don't know if you heard the rumors that uh, RFK might endorse. Donald Trump, um, and then join his uh, potential cabinet. And um, I think about that, both Trump and RFK have been talking about Bitcoin as like, oh no, they want to support Bitcoin. And so then I think to myself, okay, if what you're saying is, is true, and I believe it is true, uh, the, the tariffs will have a negative uh, impact on inflation, the different policies will have a, a different impact. That means we should expect inflation to come back with a vengeance. I can, it, yeah. If it does come back with a vengeance, any companies that are sensitive to uh, to inflation, they, those need to be shorted or to, to be avoided. But then I think about assets like they're, they're, whatever governments in place are going to want to pump the market. Like they're not going to leave the market down. They're going to pump the market, but 
they won't be able to pump up assets that are or pump up companies or or industries where they're severely being negatively impacted by inflation. And you know, at, at best they might stay stable. Um, so then I go, okay, well, well, assets would would benefit from it. And then I go, okay, well then crypto uh, certain currencies and crypto then could severely benefit from it because they're not going to have any negative impact from the inflation. I mean, you can make the case that people will have less money to spend on the assets, but then speculation becomes uh, required in an environment where other normal investments are are not going to be as profitable because of the uh, the inflation rate. So then you go, well, then there could be some sort of like backwards thing where people have to get into high performing assets like uh, like crypto to offset the inflation. And so it could cause it to go up e even higher, uh, aside from the debasement of the currency that can cause the uh, just the number to go up anyway. So then yeah. I go everywhere that I look, I want to look for, I think I just want to look for assets that are uh, uh, positively respond to inflation, uh, tips, mm -hmm. uh, certain, certain types of bonds, and for crypto, and ride those to the moon. Right. Is it true, though, that crypto was entirely uh, entirely benefited from a high inflation environment? I mean, we had we had a pretty significant drawdown during the inflationary period, didn't we? Well, if the drawdown had gone past um, the seventeen thousand dollar mark, mm. then I would have said like, okay, inflation really had a, a big impact there. But the price of Bitcoin retraced exactly to its long term trend. It's fair. So then I go. So then the um, and let's say it, let's say well the contraction of the money supply the quantitative tightening that uh, that the Fed did mm -hmm. definitely had an effect on Bitcoin and all these all these other assets and all of mm -hmm. them went through this recession like from 2022 late 2021 to 2023 um, and it happened and then it cleaned up and then they started moving up and to the right again despite the fact that inflation hadn't really come down like the price of things hadn't come down. Right. The the problem with the inflation was that people didn't the companies didn't know it was coming, but now people know that inflation is like the prices are not coming down and there's a chance they, they might go up even further. So yeah. there's not like that cr there's not that crazy spending of zero percent interest rates. It's not that's not happening and people have this expectation. But they're selling their homes in a different way. They're buying cars in a different way. They're doing travel in a different way. Understanding that prices are higher and that they're likely to go higher still. So I'm not worried about that to impact the price of uh, a Bitcoin because if it was, why would it get up to where is back now from seventeen? Mm -hmm. so I would have, I would imagine it would still continue, but the thing is the force the force um, speculation that people will be in the less places you have the less opportunity you have to make money in non risky assets the more you have to go into risky assets in order to make your perform your your money you just have to. I think it's fair, um, particularly if the stock market experiences a bit of a drawdown as a result of some of these uh, you know inflationary stock uh, shocks or even just. Um, in the outcome of the election. However, if if the market responds positively, like it did for Trump in 2016, let's assume Trump Trump wins, there's there's very likely a, a, a bull run that occurs in both markets, right? So then it's just a question of how much speculation do you want to take and where do you want to place your bets? It's such a hard thing to to think about because it it never really seems to be based on one or two variables. There's so many other factors that that go into thinking about how the election might play a role on all of these markets. But I do think that, um, that crypto is sort of dancing around this resistance zone. So from, from more of a technical perspective, the, there's a couple of things at play here that are very interesting to me. Um, and um, I'm happy to share my screen on this so we can just sort of look at the technicals on this. Liquidity is still increasing. Yeah, that's the one thing I wanted to talk about is, that uh, M2 Global Liquidity Index has been um, slowly ticking upward for this entire period. Obviously, we saw sort of an inverse relationship somewhat. I mean, it's still very highly correlated through this uptrend right here. And then since then, we've been moving upward. And it is this period that I find most interesting. This whole range of, uh, of increase in global liquidity relative to this resistance zone is is fascinating to me. Um, we've we've obviously continued to confirm this downtrend, but each time we've found pretty significant support and it's held the price up. So I'd like to see, 
you know, one more test of this resistance line um, to see if we can really start looking at crypto in bullish territory again. Um, but that global liquidity index tells us a lot about where the flow of capital is and how much available capital there is available to us in the markets. Oh man, that looks incredible. That to me looks like a cork underwater, just waiting to explode it up. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, uh, I mentioned ATR is, uh, sort of my, one of my, uh, interesting areas for consolidation or, or an indicator to keep track of. And at the moment we've been seeing ATR really kind of fall to this zone. It had one little pick, uh, uptick in that sell off recently. But when I think about where, where ATR is right now, as this continues to fall, uh, down where this is kind of red, it maybe it might be hard to see, but, um, this zone of ATR coming down and ending up back in a consolidation zone, I think tells us a lot about what the possibilities are. Uh, for price to continue. This is an area in which I would be, I'd be preparing for some upside for sure. Right. Okay. I agree. The people in my trading group, uh, they've been asking me, so Tom, is this the bottom? Is it the bottom end? <laughs> I, uh, uh, I want to see me. that. I want to see that break of resistance first, but I do think a breakout is possible. See, you're fine if waiting until Bitcoin crosses, let's say 72 and confirms there before yep. you buy it. Yeah. That to me, I'm like, I might as well not even be in the trade anymore. It's too painful. I got to buy it now. Yeah. And this is, again, the the whole risk tolerance thing, right? Like everybody's everybody's sense of risk tolerance changes. I learned a long time ago that I trade better when I wait for confirmation. And that confirmation step is a huge one for me. I write it into my strategies as well um, that uh, I want to see. I want to see traders show up and confirm that my thesis is correct first. And so what happens if it blows past 72 and gets to 100? You're like, okay, well, I just missed that trade. Well, um, I wouldn't miss it. My buy stop would be prepared after that confirmation zone. And oh, I would just be, I see. I'd be continuing to buy on the way up. I see. With okay. leverage, baby. Right. 